I'd like to say good morning to everybody. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask you Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to start in verse 21 in just a minute. This morning's message is called Receive Standing and Giving Forgiveness. We've come as far as Matthew 18, verse 20. And last time we looked at what Jesus said about church discipline and how he gave us those four steps and how they can be applied to conflict, not just in the church, but in our lives. We also learned that the goal of church discipline is always to restore that brother or sister to the church. Jesus told us about the power and authority the church has with regards to binding and loosening. This morning, we're going to look at forgiveness, receiving it, understanding it, and giving it. Peter is going to ask Jesus a question, which is going to set up Jesus telling a parable on forgiveness. And in this parable, he's going to explain it to his disciples. Not just those with him that day, but all of us. And how we can apply it in our lives. We often call this parable the parable of the unforgiving servant. Jesus is going to teach us just how critical forgiveness is and how serious God takes it when we refuse to forgive others. But especially when we withhold it from other believers. Forgiveness is the key to spiritual unity in the church. And we have no right as Christians to withhold forgiveness from others when God has given it to us. Our essential question this morning is this. Do you forgive others when they wrong? At this time, if you would, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord and pray. Precious Heavenly Father, again, we love you and we thank you for all you do for us, Lord. We thank you for the testimonies we've heard. We thank you for the ones we heard Wednesday. We thank you for all you do for us, Lord. You are a great and mighty God. You are a loving God. And we thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness you give us, Lord. And you just give it to us despite the fact that we don't deserve it. We do love you, Lord. We ask you to be with each and every name on the prayer list. Those added this morning. Those that have been on there for a long time. You know each and every one of their needs, Lord. We do love you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, touch their needs as only you can. Lord, we do love you and thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. And it's always in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so our first point this morning, Peter's question, asked and answered, verses 21 and 22. <clears throat> Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. <coughs> now, again, just to refresh your memories, Jesus has just taught the disciples about church discipline. And how the whole point of it is, is to restore that brother or sister to the church. So in light of this, they just went through this teaching. Peter asks this question of Jesus. How often should a brother or sister be forgiven? Now, Peter throws out this number of seven. Which is considered <coughs> excuse me, by the Jews to be God's number or the number of complete. So Peter throws this number out, he knows this, in an attempt to appear to be willing to go above and beyond what the traditional teaching and thinking of the rabbis were or was in that day, which was three times. They took several verses from the book of Amos 
chapter 1, verses 3, 6, 9, 11, and 13. And they taught that since God only forgave Israel's enemies three times, that three was the official number established by God of how many times we are to forgive each other. <clears throat> so you can see, Peter thinks he's one-upping them. He's went up to seven. He's better than they are. He's wanting to indicate how generous he is, how forgiving he is, how willing he is to forgive, how much better he is than what the rabbis are teaching. And he asked Jesus this question, and no doubt he is expecting Jesus to say, now you're on the right track, Peter. That's the way to think. He wants an attaboy. He wants Jesus to brag on him a little bit to the others. Be more like Peter. He's got the right idea. But that's not what Jesus does at all. Jesus tells Peter, no, the number isn't set to seven times. It's not three times. He says, we are to forgive others up to 70 times seven. <coughs> now you may be thinking, oh, so Jesus has clarified it here. He's officially established the number at 490 times of forgiveness. And once that person hits 491, all bets are off. You don't have to forgive them anymore. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying here is forgiveness is unlimited. This would be a Jewish way of saying there is no limit to it. So he's basically saying this. Remember, seven is considered that number of completeness. So he's saying forgiveness, the number is 70 times completeness, which is unlimited. It's innumerable. There is no limit. There is no number of times that you must forgive someone, and then after that, you don't have to. God has no limit on his forgiveness for us. He forgives us each and every time we fail him when we come humbly before him and ask him to. Now again, it bears repeating here that for repetition's sake so you understand this. Forgiveness is the spiritual key, or excuse me, the key to spiritual unity in the church. It is absolutely necessary if we want restoration to occur. There's no mistaking, it's no accident that this comes immediately after church discipline. If we want restoration to occur, it can't without forgiveness. You can go through the four steps Jesus covers in verses 15 to 20. And if you aren't willing to forgive, you're wasting your time. It ha we have to have forgiveness. <coughs> And that's why Jesus is going to teach us how to forgive. So I ask you again this morning, are you willing to forgive others as many times as they wrong? If you're here this morning and you're struggling with this in any way, ask God to help you with it. I promise you he will. His answer will be yes, I will help you with this. Because that's what he wants. He doesn't want us to hold a record of wrongs against each other. He wants us to forgive. So Peter's asked this question and Jesus has answered it. And all this sets up this parable <coughs> Jesus is going to go into. So let's look at the parable itself here. The unforgiving servant. <clears throat> this will take us all the way from verses 23 to 34, but we'll just talk about them as we go. Let's look at 23 and 24 together. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. <clears throat> no doubt this is a parable you've heard many times. And oftentimes, it's these passages we're so familiar with that become the most difficult to preach through. But what Jesus is saying here, he starts off with this parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven, that's the church, may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. 
Now, of course, in this parable, the king represents God and how he forgives us so we can forgive others. Then he says there's these two slaves. Well, at first he says that he wishes to settle with all the slaves here. And we come to this first slave. And we're going to see he owes 10,000 talents. Now, because this is an <coughs> astronomical amount of debt, it's very possible that in this parable, this particular slave or servant of the king is a provincial governor who owes back taxes, okay, just because of the sheer amount of it. Jesus doesn't say that. That's just kind of extrapolating from what he does give us. Um, but he owes this great amount. And I want to explain this just so that we're clear on it. A talent isn't a specific coin or a specific denomination of money. It's a measurement of weight. So that means if you have a talent of gold and a talent of silver, the gold's worth more because it weighs more. So the idea that Jesus is giving here is this is such a large debt it can't even be numbered. It's incomprehensible. Do you know anyone else who has owed the king an unpayable debt of sin? Amen. You don't. But you, me, and everybody else that's ever been created. Then in verse 25, he says, But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. Now you may be thinking, well, this king's not very nice. He's just in doing this. This man owes a debt. And the family and the man, each one will be sold for about a talent. Nowhere near going to be close enough to pay his debt. But he owes this debt to the king, and the king has the right to collect what he can on this debt. <coughs> but then we get to verse 26. It doesn't actually get that far. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrate, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now again, this is such an amount of debt he owes. It, it, it's unfathomable. So when he says this to the king, as Jesus is tell, telling us this parable, again, it doesn't say this, but in our imaginations, we can probably think this is the part where Matthew just makes a face. Being a former tax collector, there's no way he can pay that. What's this guy doing? This is an absurd request he's made to the king. No amount of time in that man's life would be enough for him to repay this debt. But that's what he asks. If you'll just be patient with me, just give me time I'll repay everything. <clears throat> what this slave is doing is he is appealing to the king for mercy. And we're going to see that the king not only gives mercy, but he's going to give him grace. Remember, mercy and grace are not the same thing. Those are not interchangeable words. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is being blessed with what you do not deserve. So again, in this parable, Jesus is sharing the king represents God who gives grace and mercy beyond belief to us. Verse 27, and the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. <coughs> he didn't set up a payment plan. He didn't say, we're still going to sell your possessions or we're still going to sell your family. We're still going to sell you, just not put you in jail. And he didn't even put him in debtor's prison. He didn't do any of that. What he did is, first he released him. You are not going to be held against your will. You're not going to be put in jail. That's the mercy. He deserved to be locked up until his debt was paid or to be sold or whatever the king decided he was going to do to him. 
But then he gives him grace. He says, your debt is forgiven. This unimaginable amount that you could never repay anyway, gone. Walked away, forgotten about. Keep that in mind. And he did this because, what's it say? He felt compassion for him. So he gets mercy, and then the king goes a step further and gives him grace. This is a picture of what God does for each and every sinner who cries out to him and repents and asks to be forgiven. You see, all mankind owes God an unpayable debt of sin. And we either accept his offer of salvation and receive his mercy and grace and we let God give us credit for what Jesus did in our place on the cross at Calvary or we choose to pay it ourselves. We can never pay this unpayable debt just like this man in the parable can't. And because holy God demands that sin be paid for. Now listen to this. And because of his justice and holiness, it means whoever chooses to pay it themselves will exist in eternity, for, uh, in hell for eternity. Now I want to remind you, this whole parable is about forgiveness. In this parable, this man has received the ultimate forgiveness. And again, it's a picture of what we get from God when we are saved. But this man is now going to show us what as Christians we are never to do. Verse 28. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. The first thing this man does after giving, excuse me, after receiving this forgiveness, this grace and this mercy, is to go and collect the debt owed to him. Now remember, if he needs this money to give it to the king, the king said his debt's forgiven. This first slave we've looked at here has absolutely no understanding or appreciation of the mercy and grace he has just received. He doesn't even understand what, what has just happened. He doesn't comprehend what forgiveness actually is. He's just thinking, Phew, I dodged one there. Got away with it. I ask you this morning, do you have an understanding of what mercy and grace really is. Do you comprehend what forgiveness really is? Do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Do you understand exactly what it is? And what Jesus did when he died in our place. I hope you really Think about this and think about it often. What exactly it was Jesus did. How he paid the debt we could never pay. He died in our place. And even before that, all the things he went through. Now this first slave comes to this other slave, the second one. To collect a hundred denarii. Where the King James says pence. It's about three months wages. This is no small chunk of change by any measure. But it's certainly nothing compared to what this first slave owed. And then he comes up. <clears throat> and sees him. Grabs him by the throat. And starts to choke him. He doesn't just come up and say hey by the way remember you owe me three months wages. Now he grabs him by the throat and starts choking him. He's very demanding. Give me what you owe me. You owe me this. Give it to me. Give it to me now. Can you see that this man is acting nothing like the king? 
He is not acting anything like the king. And so I ask us, all of us, myself included, do we act like our king? Do we act like we have been made new and we have been brought back to life? Or do we still act like the old dead version of us? Verse 29. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. What if that triggered a thought in his mind or a memory? That's the exact phrase he used with the king. The difference here is when this slave says it, it's not laughable. It's actually possible. It's reasonable. Give him enough time, he can pay three months wages back to this guy. When this first man said it to the king, it was foolish. Nowhere near possible. It made no sense when he said it, but when he hears it, he doesn't act anything like the king. Verse 30, but he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. For three months wages, he puts this man in prison. This shows us this first slave knows nothing of compassion, nothing of mercy, nothing of grace, doesn't truly <coughs> comprehend or appreciate what the king did for him. If he did, he would show this same grace and mercy to this other man. I want you to understand this. This is why it is vital that as Christians we truly understand and appreciate exactly what it means when we say our sins are forgiven. It's so we can forgive others. God didn't save us so that we could keep a record of wrongs and hope grudges. said it just a few minutes ago, I'll say it again because it's worth repeating for emphasis that forgiveness is the key to spiritual unity in the church. And when we withhold this forgiveness, it is a very un-Christ-like thing we do. And our whole, the whole point of us being saved is to be more like Jesus and less like us. We must forgive even when they don't ask for it. There will be times when they don't ask you to forgive them. That's not an excuse not to forgive them. We must forgive them when they don't deserve to be forgiven. Because guess what? We didn't deserve to be forgiven either. As Christians, we do not have the right to not forgive. We must understand the necessity of giving forgiveness because when we claim this right we do not have, we withhold this forgiveness. All it does is harden our own hearts. And the more you withhold, the harder your heart gets. This man not only refused to forgive, but he has him put into the debtor's prison. Until his debt is paid. Understand this. He did everything to this other slave. That the king could have done to him. But chose not to. He is so far unlike the king. It's mind blowing. Verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. They're upset. They're grieved. They're offended. That word deeply grieved can also be offended. They are offended at this man and what he has done to this other man. And so they go and tell the king, this man you just set free, that you forgave his debt, listen to what he's doing. And I say this to all of us. When believers refuse to forgive others, it should grieve and offend us as fellow believers. 
Because it certainly offends God. We who are his children, when we do this, we're not acting like him. And then we know it offends God because God will chasten his unforgiving children out of love. Jesus is going to touch on that when we get down to verse 35, but we also know it's taught in the book of Hebrews. Those whom he loves, he chastises. Verses 32 and 33. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? The answer is yes, he should have. But he did not. Notice here, Jesus says, you wicked slave. This king is angry. He's angry at this man. He's saying you should have treated him like I treated you. Again, this king is representative of God. And God expects us as believers to forgive others as he's forgiven us. And if we truly, listen, if we truly understand what it is we've been forgiven of, what it is we've been washed clean of, we will forgive others. It's not going to be easy. But we must do it. And if we struggle with it, we must come before God, humble ourselves, and ask him to help us with it. And it may take time, but he will. If we come to him, he will help us with this. Even in the situations where you think, I can never forgive that person. If you come to God and you ask God to help you, he will help you. It may take time. I'm not saying it's going to be an overnight process. But if you truly want God to help you, if you open your heart up to God, God will unharden it, just like he did before. If we truly understand what he's given to us, we will give it to others. Forgiveness. Verse 34. And his Lord moved with anger, and it's a righteous anger handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. <coughs> now, if the torturers or tormentors, as the King James says, make one note of that, not execution. This is not about putting him to death. And then it says, Jesus says, until all until he repaid all that was owed him. Not talking about that original debt. That's been forgiven. The debt he owes the king now is to learn the lesson of forgiveness. He's saying, until you learn and you appreciate what it is I've done for you, you're going to go and you're going to be handed over to the torturers, the tormentors. Our king does the same thing sometimes. How many of us have been turned over to the tormentors until we learn the lesson God wants us to learn? And he does that because he loves us. He chastises those who he loves. Remember, he is holy God. He's perfectly just. He's always angry at sin, especially when it is his children committing it. God knows that those who have never been saved, they're going to sin. That's, he understands that. But when we've been forgiven of our sins, he expects us to do all we can not to sin. He knows we won't be perfect. Not until we get our glorified bodies. That old nature is completely gone. But we call it sanctification, progressive sanctification. That is simply the process of being more like Jesus and less like ourselves each and every day. What he says we are to do. I say this, if you find yourself 
being handed over to the torturers. Spend time in prayer and ask God to reveal to you, you don't already know what it is, what the problem is in your own heart, because that's where it's at. It's not up here. It's in the heart. Or if you already know exactly what it is, then you jump straight to, God, help me learn what you want me to learn from this and help me forgive this person I need to forgive. And again, it, I'm not saying it's going to be an overnight process. But as long as it takes, we need to commit to this so that we can let go of the grudge and of the, of the wrongs that they've done to us. For our own heart's sake. Lest it be hardened. If you remember in the Old Testament, what happened to Pharaoh as he would harden his own heart, then God got to the point where he was hardening Pharaoh's heart. We don't want to get to that point. If God turns you over to the torturers, ask him to help you learn the lesson, accept the chastisement, and then do better. Do better. If we take it seriously when he does this, we will do better. Doesn't mean we'll be perfect again, but we will do better. We will learn from what we did before. Now, our last verse this morning gets its own little subtitle here. Jesus applies the parable. Because the parable means absolutely nothing if we don't know what he's talking about, how it applies to us. And he gives that to us, verse 35. He says, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. He just wraps it all up, ties it all up together. That's how we know, excuse me, the king represents God. And he's saying in this parable form, this is exactly what we're to do. Don't be like the first guy. We've got to forgive others. He said this to Peter and all the disciples with him, but he's also saying it to all of his disciples here in 2024. How much should we forgive? How often? Each and every time they wrong us. Or we're going to spend time with the torturers till we learn the lesson. You see, Jesus is talking here about true and real forgiveness, not and I know you know somebody that's done this. Maybe you've done it yourself. Probably have. I know I have. You say you forgive somebody, but you don't really forgive them. You you, you give lip service. Yeah, I, I forgive you. Go on. And in the back of your mind, I'm still angry about that. That's, oh, I can't get over it. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about real, genuine forgiveness. And how do we know if it's real? How do we know if it's genuine? It don't come from the mouth. It comes from the heart. It don't come from the head. Oh, I tell them I forgive them so they're going to leave me alone, but I don't really know. It comes from the heart. You actually feel it. You mean it. Anything else, any other so-called forgiveness is phony forgiveness, and it would only lead to the hardening of our own hearts. So before we conclude our message this morning, I ask you this question one more time. Do you forgive others when they wrong you? This morning we have seen Jesus answer Peter's question about how often we are to forgive others. (laughs) There is no magic number. It's unlimited. Don't be like Peter and say, well, I'm going to go up to 500 then. Jesus stopped at 490. No, it's not what he meant. And we've seen Jesus use this question Peter asks to jump into this parable of this unforgiving servant to teach this very important lesson on forgiveness. How we receive it, how we have to understand it, how we have to give it. And then he says in verse 35, you better apply it to your own life. The truth is, church, if we have been forgiven of our sins by God, Forgiving others is not optional. It's a requirement. And if we truly understand all that Jesus did for us, we will forgive others. Again, it may not be easy. It depends on what they did. Some things are easier for us to forgive than others, but we must forgive all as long as it takes 
And we need God's help to do it. The good news is he's always there to help us. If you truly want to forgive somebody and you're having a hard time with it, you come to God, God's not going to say, I wouldn't forgive him for that. You're justified in not forgiving them. That's what the world will tell you. But God will say, yes, I don't want your heart to be hardened. Let me help you with this. If that's something you've been struggling with, don't take my word for it. Put God to the test and see that he will help you with this. Because I can stand up here and tell you all day long, but until you experience it, then you'll know that what I'm saying is true. What God's word says is true. Sometimes we need that chastisement to remind us we need to forgive others. But he loves us enough to give that to us also. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you don't really know anything about forgiveness. You don't understand it. You don't comprehend it. You can listen to the world, and the world says, well, you don't have to do that. If that's you this morning, you can change that today. You can experience what it is to be forgiven of your sins and then you will be able to forgive others. So I say, as the Holy Spirit is drawing you even now, say yes to Jesus and experience this forgiveness of sins so that you can forgive others. At this time, I'll ask Sister Carla if she would come back to Hannah. Page 338. service this morning. Just because we're through with our service doesn't mean God's through with you. Right now, you can feel the Holy Spirit drawing you 
but you resist him and you feel him as the day goes on, quit resisting. You don't have to be in this building to be saved. But if he is drawing you now, know this. This may be the last time he draws you. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Say yes to him. Know what it means to be forgiven. And you will, I promise you, you will be able to forgive others for what they've done to you. Thank you for your attentiveness to God's word this morning. I'll ask Brother Calvin if he would close us out in prayer. Before we do that, Brother Calvin, uh, I need a couple of guys, just a couple, Help me put up some tables in the back in the uh, fellowship hall, okay? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we, <clears throat> once again, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be here to hear your thank word. You. We thank you for our brother Jeremy, Father, mm-hmm. for the word that he, he's given us this morning. Lord, we pray that we can just take it out into our lives, Father, that it may, may further us to be better Christians and, and to just bless us, Lord God. <clears throat> Lord, once again, we pray that you'll bless each and every one on our prayer list, Lord, those who are in in need of a touch from your healing hand, Lord, just bless them, lift them up, give them strength, Father. Be with us, and guys, Father, until we come back again at the appointed time, Lord, we just say love you. We give you praise and honor, Father. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. We just praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.